Welcome everybody to the Healing Place Podcast. I am your host, Terry Welbrock, and excited to have with me today, Dr. Amir Rashidian. So welcome. Hi, Terry. Hello, everybody. I'm so honored to be here. Thanks so much for having me. Oh my gosh, yes. It's wonderful to have you. I just told you before we started recording, I was stalking YouTube for you and, you know, looked at looked at your book on, on Amazon and uh, really excited to have you here and talk about all that you're doing and in the world of chiropractic and beyond uh, to help people along their healing journey. So, so yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Yeah. You know, it, it, it started out because a lot of my patients were saying that stress is their main problem, you know, and, and, and I can relate uh, as you can, as uh, you know, stress can cause a lot, a lot of the illnesses, uh, obesity, heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, all those things have a link to stress. And so I thought we need to figure out how to solve this problem. Why is it that, you know, um, just reducing our stress isn't helping? A lot of people are doing that. There's a lot of experts out there who teach you how to reduce your stress. But it just doesn't seem to be working. Uh, so, so I thought maybe I'd write a few things about that. And it ended up, uh, it, it was a talk first, and then it became a book. And we'll see where it goes next. Yeah, well, I read the back cover and I love it how, and I read the reviews on Amazon and just amazing the impact that, that, you know, because it's your story, but also you took like your your clients or patients' um, stories and integrated it into the book as well. That's right. That's right. I mean, um, I, my um, my story started when I was nine years old. There was a village in Iran. Uh, my dad and I were traveling, and we ran into this uh, uh, in a village. You know, mud huts, very, very primitive type place. There was an in-ground oven where they're baking bread. There's no motorized vehicles, no power lines, no plumbing. Uh, I mean, very, very primitive. Wow. And this woman went into labor uh, right there. And at the age of nine, I was looking in, at, at this woman who, who was told because of complications, she's not going to survive. Oh. And midwife was there. That's the only form of health care they had. And this midwife walked away and left her alone with her husband and everyone knew she was going to die. And I literally had a panic attack at the age of nine looking at this going, this can't be. How is it no one can help? And, and so when dad and I climbed down the mountain, we got in our car to drive home, I decided I had to become a doctor. I wanted to be the surgeon that helps everybody. I want to be a surgeon who carries his medical bag with him. And, and whenever there's a situation like that where anybody else would feel helpless, I'd be the one to jump in and help. And uh, so 10 years passed. And I was a student at uh, uh, George Washington University. And, and I was doing well, getting ready to go to medical school. I wanted to apply to medical school. And uh, right along that time, I went home for Christmas break. Our home was now in Maryland. And we had moved from the from Iran to the United States, and um, I went home. And my dad had this big, thick white neck brace on, and he was under the influence of some heavy painkillers, and he couldn't lift his arms to give me a hug. Uh, he was limp and numb from his shoulders all the way down. Wow! We spent my Christmas break going from doctor to doctor, trying to figure out what's wrong with dad. And every doctor we went to said, "This is beyond my scope. You have to go to this." other doctor and finally we ended up in a neurosurgeon's office and you know neurosurgeons operate that they wanted to operate on his neck they wanted to cut him open in the back of the neck and break and remove the bones from the back i mean this was going to be pretty intense right. they would put rods and screws into his neck fuse his whole neck so that he'd never be able to turn his head again and they said he might not even regain function of his hands and they said we're hoping you have less pain and there's a chance you might not survive because of your age and my dad was 70 so, uh, and, and you know, this is, there's such a thing as a young 70 and an old 70. That, that, that number doesn't mean anything, right? But my dad was the older 70 because he hadn't taken care of himself. And so, um, you know, we had to opt for that surgery. We talked to three neurosurgeons. All three agreed that he needs that surgery. And, uh, you know, and the unfortunate part is he already can't use his hands. Uh, my dad had a passion. He loved writing. He, he always had a pen and pad with him everywhere he you know, went, and he was writing letters and jokes and poems and stories. He, he likes writing letters to the president of the United States once a month to tell him how to do his job. And <laughs> it was a joke, but he did it, you know, but he couldn't hold a pen. He couldn't work. He couldn't provide for his family. And, uh, and now we're risking that that was going to be a permanent situation, and the surgery was just to, to, you know, preserve his life. 
We got in this taxi to go home after the third neurosurgeon. So they scheduled the surgery. They said, go get your affairs in order. Come back in a week. We'll operate. We're sitting in the back of the taxi. And, and because we just came from the neurosurgeon, I was carrying all the x-rays and MRIs and CTs and medical records. You know, nowadays they come on a CD on one disc. Right. Back then, 25 years ago, that was a heavy stack of stuff. And in the back of the taxi, I was holding that. I looked over at my dad. He was cringing because every bump that taxi hit was sending a lightning bolt of pain through his entire body. Mm -hmm. Looking in his eyes, I can tell he wishes he was dead. I mean, I could tell he was suffering. And I was feeling helpless all over again, the same way I did when I saw that woman die in her husband's arms in that village. But now, there's nothing I can do still, and I'm still feeling the same you know, feelings. So uh, this taxi driver looks at the two of us in the rear view mirror and said, I know you're in a lot of pain and I know you just asked me to take you home, but there's actually a chiropractor right down the street this way. If you like, I'll take you there. I was 19 years old. I thought I knew everything. I said, absolutely not. We're not going there. But my dad being wiser, didn't want to have the surgery. He said, let's try it. Long story short, this chiropractor, because I had all those x-rays and MRIs, we walked in, he looked at the MRIs, he looked at my dad, and right there and then he said, I think I can help you. And, uh, and it's not going to be easy, you know, quick fix, but uh, if you're willing to take a chance, you want to postpone that surgery, I can have you feeling better in six months to a year. Do you want to try it? And dad said, for sure, we're going to do it. He did it. And, uh, you know, six months later, he walked into that office. He was able to hold his hand up and, and write. You know, they, they have that sign-in sheet that you walk into a doctor's yeah. office. See, every time he walked in, the receptionist behind the counter had to write his name for him. But after those six months, he picked up the pen. He wrote his own name on that sign-in sheet. And everybody just celebrated and clapped. And the receptionist was crying for him. And no. he lived another 18 years. And wow. He, 88 and at 88 he was actually younger than when he was 70 because he would wake up and work out and exercise and go visit his friends and they were in nursing homes but not my dad he's living a good life enjoying that life traveling across the country and abroad and he lived long enough to stand right next to me as my best man when I got married he got to meet my first son when he was born oh. so you, you know I, I, um, I tell the story because that's where all my passion comes from. And that's why I ended up being a, uh, being a chiropractor, not a surgeon. And uh, that's why I focus on stress because I remember the stress that that caused. And the question I would always ask, and I ask all my audience as well as I want to ask your audience is, you know, when my dad was sick and he was suffering and he was hurting, was my dad the only one who suffered? And the answer is no. Right. Everyone suffers. And so the first thing we need to realize is when we allow our health to decline, we're literally hurting the people who love us and care about us. That's why this podcast is important. That's why we need to not only be here and listen to this information and put it on the ground and implement it, um, but to teach others about it and tell others about it so that they can learn this because they want their family. See, we always take care of everybody else, don't we? Right, right. We, we say, I'm, I'm going to give to so-and-so. I'm going to take care of my spouse and my kids and, and everybody else, and, and I'll neglect my own health because that's the selfless thing to do. The fact is the selfless thing to do is to do what you do, Terry, which is take care of you, right? You, 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 we talked about this, right? You take care of you. you. You make sure you see the people that need to be seen so that your health is a priority because what does your family, your, your three children, you, you know, what, what does your family need from you right. is the best you. Yes. And you've been doing that. So that's kind of where my story started. Beautiful. And you know, I love that you dove right into stress because I wrote a little quote down, you know, on my, on my sheet here that had all my information about you. And the one thing that struck me in one of the videos I watched was you said stress by itself is not good or bad. And so I thought that was very fascinating because you were you, in this particular video, you were talking about, you know, gravity isn't good or bad. Fire isn't good or bad. You know, fire cooks your food or fire can burn your hand. That's and right. Stress and that um, it's not the stress that is good or bad, but what we do with it. And I thought that was very profound. Exactly. You know, most of us don't understand. I didn't understand the true definition of stress. If I just say, what is stress? The 
the first thing we think about is, oh, you know, when, when my kids weren't acting right, that's, that's stress. Is that really the true definition of stress? Because medically speaking, lifting some weights is also stress. Right when when you put some load on your body, running on a treadmill, or running outside in this be- beautiful weather today, that is stress. Right, it stresses your heart and your lungs. Lifting weights will stress your joints, your muscles. Are we saying those are bad things? We we can't say they're bad. You right. know, now if we lift weights the improper way that can injure us, yeah, then we can say that was bad. But by itself, lifting weights doesn't seem to be bad. So. I kind of took that concept and here's, here's the definition of stress. Stress is actually a force that causes change in your life. So the stress being a neutral force, the change it causes can be good or bad, right? positive or negative, right? Like you, you mentioned fire. Yeah. The change it causes is a healthy food that I can eat now that's safe of, you know, uh, without bacteria or viruses. So it's healthy to eat. The change was good. But if it burns my hand, it cooks my hand instead of my food. Now it did the same thing. So you can't say fire was bad. You know, money is another one. Money's a force. You know, we can use money to put our children through college. We can use money to, to serve a charity. Uh, we can use money to feed the hungry. But we can also use money to fund terrorist activity. But the money, you can't say money is bad. You can't say money is good. It's how you use it. And if stress is a force that causes change, it's how we use it. And unfortunately, right now, because, you, you know, back in the day, uh, you remember this, um, way back, like 1980s, early 80s, uh, sh- um, they said fat is the bad, right? right? All diseases are because of fat. And the wonderful rice cake was invented. Do you remember this? Where everybody was eating rice cakes because that was healthy for you. There's no fat in rice cakes. Whole industries were created because of the fat-free movement. Oh, this is fat-free, this is fat-free. Eat all you want, right? Now, what happened? Did right. it get healthier? No. <laughs> no. Did obesity decrease or increase? Increased. Yeah. And, and so, so did all the other diseases like heart disease and cancer. I mean, you know, in the 70s, I don't remember a lot of people having cancer. Right. In the 80s, it was a word that was really, really scary. Haven't we kind of gotten numb to that word? Yeah. Used to be, we would gasp. Someone said cancer, and now, now it seems like everybody. I, 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 there, I know so many people. Like almost, it seems like weekly on Facebook. You know, oh, please pray for so and so who has cancer. Yeah, and praise God, we've gotten good at treating it. Yes, so fewer people are dying from it, but we haven't prevented a thing. It's just gotten more. There's more types of it and more of it and more people are getting it. So cutting the fat wasn't the the answer, right? And the next movement was in the 1990s. 1991, sugar-free drinks came out because we said it wasn't fat. We were wrong. It was sugar. I'm not disagreeing with that. Fat in excess is not good. Sugar in excess is not good. But taking the sugar out of all these things – did that reduce obesity? No. Again, we are, we are unhealthy now more so than we were back in the 90s. So sugar-free drinks, sugar-free products, all this stuff, uh, whole new diet systems came out, the Atkins diet and the, the ketogenic diet. Now, again, they all have merit. I'm not against those for the right reasons, for the right purpose, but we blamed all our illnesses on just sugar. It's never one thing. And this is something I write about regularly. I speak about the mon- monocausal um, system of disease. That does not exist. Nothing was caused by one thing. Right. There's always at least three things that caused the illness. Whatever that illness might be, if it's heart disease, cancer, diabetes, arthritis, obesity, it's three things. And I'll talk to you about the three dimensions of stress. So we went into the 2000s going, it wasn't really fat. Cutting the sugar didn't solve our problems. It must be stress. We're just a stressed out society. And so the, the thing is, let's, uh, aren't there more yoga studios now than ever before? <laughs> you know, there's more massage. You did the whole business. Uh, there are a lot of businesses that the, um, uh, membership system of massage 
companies came out. And, oh, yeah. You know, the, all these wellness centers, everything's a wellness center now. We don't even know what the word wellness ne- means truly, but we got wellness centers everywhere to reduce our stress so we, we can be well. Um, there's um, uh, uh, medical institutions that detect cancer, like uh, mammography centers and, and um, radiography centers that are calling themselves wellness centers because they believe that um, detecting cancer early will prevent cancer. Detecting it is not going to prevent it. Right. Prevent there. It. <laughs> Detection finds it, which right. is good. Right. Again, there's merit to that. Just like there was merit to reducing fat in our diet, merit to reducing sugar in our diet, there is merit to managing our stress, but we can't blame stress for our diseases. Right. Because the more we reduce stress, the weaker we get as a society. That's a tough one for most people because most it, of us. That makes and, sense though, because yeah. stress yeah. helps you be stronger. Yes. You know, like you said, lifting the weights causes stress on your muscles, but what also is happening? Strength. You're, you're strengthening your muscle. Yeah. Yeah, brilliantly put. Exactly. And that's, that's my mission now is yeah. just to get everybody to understand that one concept is – if I went to the gym today and I, let's say, lifted 100 pounds and tomorrow I went back to the gym and only did 90 pounds and every time I went back to the gym, I reduced the load I put on my body, there will come a day where I can't even lift that 100 pounds anymore. I will lose that ability. But if I go back to the gym, let's say, next week and I add just a couple of pounds to that weight and try to do 105 instead of 100, now I'm challenging my body to get stronger. The goal to reduce stress is synonymous to becoming weaker and eventually dying. There was a um, uh, Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. You might have seen this book, The Power of Positive Thinking. Yes. The great book, right? No, so, I only – my dad. Oh, my gosh. My dad passed when he was 72, but that was like his Bible, you know? Right? You love that book. Absolutely. I do too. I have read that I don't know how many times and I love the book. There's a story about the author, Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. They say he was in his office uh, doing a counseling session and he was talking to a gentleman who was very stressed out, um, very unhappy with his life. And this gentleman said, Dr. Peale, my problem is stress. I have too much stress in my life. And Dr. Peale said, how would you like to meet some people who don't have any stress in their life? And he said, really? Can I do, do they exist? He said, they exist. Well, let's meet them. How, what do they do? I want to do what they do. I want to be what they are. Dr. Peel said, well, I'll show you. Come follow me. So he walked out the front, the, the door of his office, down the hallway, out the front doors of the church, across the parking lot, onto the cemetery. And he said, nobody here has any stress. They're all underground. And so reducing stress is like taking a step closer to that graveyard, to, to, to dying. We, have, we need stress to live. We need, stress not only sustains life, it, it promotes it. It increases it. We want to really live a full life. We need to be willing to take on some stress. So is the solution then coping, coping skills? Great question. Um, so, so yes, yes, uh, to a degree. Um, you know, we need to train for stress. We need to focus on getting stronger. The solution to all that is, let's say, so the, the, the person who comes to you and says, I have a lot of stress in my life, you could say, yeah, we have two options. One is we reduce the stress. The other is we strengthen you. So we can't do both, right? Do you know the best way to reduce stress? or eliminate stress even is to leave your family and leave your job. Right. Right. Ridiculous. Right. Who would do that? Doesn't make any sense. But most of our stress comes from our um, need to provide for our family and our, our family itself. So we don't want to do that. So we have to become stronger. So to get stronger, we have to train for it. Find out what your capacity is and go a little bit above your capacity. Once that becomes easy, it's like first grade, uh, you were spelling words that had three letters in them. 
cat, bat, rat. And, and second grade, those words weren't difficult anymore. And now you can spell words that have many letters and it's not that hard. So uh, we need to train for that. So stress comes in three dimensions. It, most of us think of stress in the psychological realm, realm meaning, um, you know, I, I'm stressed out because I'm unhappy. I'm stressed out because I'm angry or I'm depressed or, or, or anxious or all of those things. That's only one third of stress. The other third is physical, physical stress. We talked about weight training, right? Uh, poor posture. If we sit all day, there's a stress on our body. More arthritis is caused by sitting all day than running out on pavement. That used to be the, the myth. Oh, don't run so much because you'll cause hip arthritis. But really, most people get knee replacements, hip replacements it's because they sat all day because joints fuse together when you don't move them. Right. But when you pound that joint, uh, fluid goes in and out of the cartilage, keeps it healthy, keeps it strong. Um, and we can talk about that more, but really the third dimension of stress is biochemical. So what we expose ourselves to chemically, what chemicals are we putting on our skin? What chemicals are we breathing in that we don't even know? And what's in our food that we're eating? So, so it's physical, chemical, and emotional or psychological. And if we address the three dimensions, now you achieve wellness. Remember how I said you don't know, or, or most people don't understand the word wellness. What right. is, if I asked, if I asked a hundred people, what's the definition of wellness? You'll get everything from feeling good, looking good, being able to do things right, going for a run and not having pain. That's wellness. Well, I'm not going to disagree with any of those definitions. I'm just going to challenge it to say, maybe those are the byproduct of wellness. Meaning if you're well, you're going to look good and feel good. If you're well, you're going to be able to build memories with your children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and live a long time and enjoy that, right? But the definition of wellness is this other thing, which is the degree to which health and vitality is experienced in the three dimensions of life. How much vitality do you have in each of those dimensions is what wellness is. So if you want to achieve wellness, you have to pick something in each of the three dimensions and improve it by just a little bit. Yes. Saying we have with my patients, we say, if you want to improve by 100%, pick 100 things and improve them by 1%. It shouldn't be difficult. Right. Yeah. I yeah. love it. And I, I so understand what you're saying. I, I'm that person. I pride myself at 53. I take zero medications. I take some supplements like flaxseed oil and some apple cider vinegar, but I don't, I, like I'm on nothing. And I'd gone to my doctor for a physical, you know, a few months ago, maybe six months ago. And she said, oh, my, that my cholesterol was creeping up. And I said, okay. And she instantly, because it's what physicians do, you know, wanted to throw a pill at it. And I, so I reminded her that I have a more of a holistic approach to life and my health. And I said, no. I'm not going to take a pill, but I'm going to make some changes in my life. So give me three months. And she said, all right, I'll give you three months. So I went home, did some research, read options for, you know, foods and diet changes and, and increasing, started hiking more, started biking, joined the gym so that I could get into the pool because it was winter here and I wanted to swim and move. And so I made changes in what I was doing with activity and I made changes with what I was putting into my body with food and went back and did the lab work. And she said, triglycerides are, you know, back to where they need to be. You know, you're a uh, good like LDL and HDL, you know, whatever they, they were, they were adjusting. Um, still have some work to do on it, but I, I just took a take on the philosophy that, you know, what, like you said, making myself stronger, not that I'm anti-medicine because, you know, people need to take, do their own route, but me personally, I don't like that as an option. So I, I did. I, and I think that's a, an amazing suggestion for people on how to change their life is what you were just saying about, you know, even 1%, take, yeah. make that little change in your life. Brilliant. Brilliant. I mean, this is why I've been looking forward to talking to you for so long. <laughs> 
<laughs> exactly that. Like you know, you and I, we're we're not telling everybody to do that. Obviously, you know, the, if they have a prescription that a doctor's prescribed for them, obviously you stick with that. Right. But would it hurt to do a little bit of research on your own, uh, like you did, and 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 find out if there's an alternative or if there's a better way? If if that medication was um, only going to promote health in your life, wouldn't yeah. we do it to our children? Wouldn't we start everybody on it from the day they're born? Right. But the, the, there's a textbook called the PDR, Physician's Desk Reference. It's about that thick, and two-thirds of it is a list of side effects. Side effects, yes. And one-third is the actual drugs. You go, that is crazy how much those things can do to us and how dangerous they can be. And so, so you mentioned uh, triglycerides. This is something else that, that um, believe it or not, is a direct response to stress. Triglycerides, cholesterol, you mentioned LDLs and HDL. Now, um, in, I'm going to say in the old days, even though we, this, these are the old days right now, but the <laughs> day coming where they're going to say what I'm saying. In the old days, they would say that LDLs are bad cholesterol and HDLs are good cholesterol. Now we have learned there is no such thing as bad anything. It's not bad because if it's produced by your body, it's not bad unless it's an autoimmune disease, right? Right. It's not, you, your body is on your side. Ah. Everything your body does is to promote your chance of survival. So let's look at what cholesterol is. If you look at the molecular, and I was a chemistry major in, in, in college, so, so that's my, my first degree is in chemistry. If you look at the molecular structure of cholesterol and put it right next to a vitamin D molecule, they look almost identical. Cholesterol is what builds every cell in your body, your skin cells, your liver cells, your bone cells, your eye cells, your nail cells, your your Every organ in your body, intestines, stomach, everything's made of cholesterol. The membrane, the bilipid membrane is triglycerides, and cholesterol builds that. So every cell in your body requires cholesterol. So here's a fact. If someone hits me with a bat right now really hard and I get a big bruise on my arm, do you know that that moment my liver will start to produce more cholesterol? instantly and for the next seven to ten days i will have more cholesterol in my body because those cells need to be repaired and the ones that just died need to be replaced with new cells every cell the membrane of it which is the biggest part of it is is made of cholesterol and triglycerides and why cholesterol looks so much like vitamin d is because when your skin gets hit with sun your body will take the sun rays and it hits cholesterol and it converts it to vitamin D. So if we lower our cholesterol too much, our vitamin D levels will go down as well. And we won't have that. And vitamin D is necessary for heart health, mental health, bone health. So if we don't have, uh, now think about this. Some people lower their cholesterol so much that below 160 is way too low. Below 160 cholesterol actually is when you have all these other issues like um, sexual dysfunction heart disease, more susceptibility to cancer. So you go, wow, so it can't be too high and it can't be too little. It sounds a little like your blood pressure, right? It sounds a little bit like your temperature, right? Believe it or not, your body has a mechanism to monitor and control your cholesterol. It already knows what your cholesterol should be. So temperature, we all know everybody should be around 98.6. But not everybody's blood pressure is going to be exactly 120 over 70. Different people have different needs. We call that an allostatic load. If there's a load on the body, the body will respond by raising its blood pressure. If I put you, uh, Terry, on a treadmill and I say, I want you to run fast, should I expect your heart rate to stay where it was? Right, no. Should I expect your blood pressure to stay where it was? No. And then because, it, because your heart rate and your blood pressure went up, should I put you on a pill now and say, oh, no, this is terrible? Because, <laughs> you know, unfortunately, you'll pass out. If your blood pressure does not go up when you're running on a treadmill, you're, you'll pass out because you won't have enough um, of a response to the load that's on your body. 
Cholesterol is exactly the same way, exactly the same way. I guarantee you, if you spend 10 minutes worrying about something that's horrible, your cholesterol will go up that day, guaranteed. I worked at NIH for two years, National Institutes of Health in the pathology lab. And then what's really neat about being a, re being a research institution is there's all these research studies going on around you, which is really fun because if you take a break, all you do is go two tables over and you go, what are you working on? And they'll tell you. And it's phenomenal. It's cutting edge. It's incredible. And there was this one room way off on the side, like this like dark place that, that um, not a lot of people visited, but there was this one lady who sat in front of a computer and I went over there and I said, what, what are you working on? She said, well, I'm trying to prove that your cholesterol fluctuates, that it's not always the same. This was 1995. So, and I said, I want to know about this. And she said, so far we have this many subjects and, and, you know, just give me some blood every morning for the next 10 days. And I want to know. And she was doing that 10 days of taking a blood sample, checking cholesterol levels every day. She found that your cholesterol will fluctuate by 20 points one way or another day to day. Wow. So today could be 200 and tomorrow it'll be 180. So if you had a check tomorrow, your doctor would have said you're normal. Right. But you check it today, they'll say it's too high. And then, you know, another day might be 220. It might jump up the other way. And they'll say, oh, it's really high. Let's check it every day and take an average and see what it is. That would tell you a different story. And then right. you got to be sure during those 10 days, you don't worry about anything. Uh, nothing hits you. You don't get a bruise or a bump. Uh, you don't eat anything crazy. I mean, your cholesterol fluctuates so much. Now, why do I say LDLs are not bad? The reason they say LDLs are bad is because they are low density, which means higher probability of them placking your arteries. HDLs, high density lipids, they are produced by your liver. They go out, they find low density lipids, they bring them back to the liver. So liver produces both the LDL and the HDL and sends them out. Why would the liver do that? Well, because something tells it to do that. Typically it's your brain. Your brain through a nerve tells your liver, we're gonna need more cholesterol. Well, which one, which type do you need? We need a little bit of LDLs, low densities. Oh, aren't those bad? No, they're not bad. You know why? Because we're going to use them to build cells. They're the ones, by the way, we're talking about stress, right? Yes. Have you ever wondered why we have food cravings under stress? I, just, I, I mean, I know I have them. <laughs> yeah, we all do, right? But here's the science behind it. When you're first stressed, like something just happened, you, you're, you're, you got worried about something, you're going to have sugar cravings first. Why? Because your heart rate's a little higher, your blood pressure's a little higher, everything's more alert, right? Everything's working more. So your body has a higher demand for glucose, which is high octane fuel. You need more of that. So you're going to, if you, if, if you stay under stress for, for the whole day, at the end of the day, when you walk past a bowl of M&Ms, or, or Skittles, you know, or, or even sugar cubes, I don't know, you're going to have this urge, I need it. And right. you're, you're, gonna, you're not going to be able to eat just one because of stress, because of the dem demand on sugar in your body. You're going to eat the whole bowl, the whole bag of eminence. Then if you stay on that stress even longer, let's say several days, now your body will, will switch. Now your body needs uh, the LDLs to burn as fuel because it's, it's using up the sugar, but it's not enough to sustain you long term. Fat burns slower and it sustains you longer. So now your cravings are going to change. So you've stayed under stress for, let's say, a month. Now, believe it or not, instead of just craving the chocolate, which you still will, now you need something fatty and sweet. Now you're going to go for the donuts and the ice cream, right? You've been under stress too long. You're in second stage of stress. Now, my, it's much more complicated than this, but just to simplify it, I've got just three stages. So the second stage, you're craving that, that fatty food, donuts, ice cream. Uh, you'll want a burger, but you'll want to mosh it down with a milkshake. Right. So, uh, <laughs> so that's, that, that's a second thing. Hold on one sec. No okay. problem. He needed to come up. Sorry. Puppy, of course. <laughs> Welcome to the show. <laughs> well, see, now you, you doing that right now, you lowered not just your cholesterol, 
but the dog's cholesterol. Yeah. How some blood pressure, some therapy dog, right? For sure. For sure. Everybody should have one. Exactly. <laughs> now, and that's the stage where your cholesterol level is going to be high because not only are you ingesting more triglycerides, but you, you also have a higher demand for the triglycerides. So low density lipids are going to be high. High stress people always have higher LDLs. That should be there because if you lower it, the demand stays high and the supply goes down and then now there's a need. Your body will figure out a way to do that. It'll, it'll mobilize triglycerides through your body fat. Your liver will continue to produce it. Uh, that's why most people who change their diet only, you, you, did, you, you addressed all three dimensions. Brilliant, right? But the person who just says, I'm just going to stop eating eggs, I'm just going to stop eating things that have cholesterol in them, their liver will just produce more and their cholesterol will stay the same. They're the ones that go back to the doctor after three months. The doctor says, nothing's changed. I'm sorry, we're going to put you on the medication. And the medication, a statin drug, goes to the liver, suppresses your liver's ability to produce cholesterol. I don't know if I want that. I want my liver to do what it knows how to do and continue right. to do that, right? Yeah. Unless it's too high. Someone's cholesterol is 1,300 drug. And I had a patient whose cholesterol was 1,300 and with drugs dropped down to 570. Wow. So that person, yeah, they, they should definitely take the medication. Yes. Some kind of a genetic thing. That's crazy. I was going to say, the liver forgot what it was doing. So <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. The overachieving liver is what that yes. is. Uh, yeah, turn it off. Um, right. But now there's the third stage, right? Third stage is called exhaustion. So when I, I call these wired in the first stage, you're wired. You're, you're really alert. You're, you're actually are a little bit of a superhuman at that point. The second stage is wired and tired. That's when you crave the donuts and ice creams. That's when you say, I'm too tired to fall asleep. You put your head on your pillow. You close your eyes. Thoughts are floating through your brain. You can't shut them down. I'll give you a solution for that, by the way. Uh, you can't fall asleep. You're wired and tired. The third stage is exhaustion. Now you've burned up your adrenal glands. There's no more adrenaline, adrenaline being produced. Cortisol levels are fluctuating and your body is just tired. You know, that's the person who falls asleep all the time. The minute the movie starts, they're out. They could be in a movie theater watching some kind of a super exciting movie, but they fall asleep two minutes into the theater. We know those people. Yeah. They can't sit through church without falling asleep. They can't sit through a classroom without falling asleep. They could sleep standing up if they wanted to. Right. That person is under adrenal fatigue. That person will still crave the sugar because they need the energy. They'll still crave the donuts and the ice cream because they need the fat. But now their main craving is pretzels and potato chips. They need salt. Salt and minerals are what, what their body needs because of adrenal fatigue. That's the person who can drink coffee and still go to bed. They can drink coffee at 9 p.m. and go to bed at 10 and still asleep. That shouldn't be the case. If you drink coffee, you should have a hard time falling asleep right. for, for, you know, three hours. Right. And so those are the stages. Uh, tell me if uh, it makes sense. Yeah, it absolutely does. And one of the things that struck me so much is that, you know, I, I talk a lot about, you know, the body or just the universe um, life we want to be balanced. And so we're always trying to, and I've said that myself about, you know, the body is trying to create a sense of balance. Um, the, the, the world is trying to create a sense of balance. The universe is trying to create a sense of balance and it's all part of nature. And so I, you know, I try to remind myself, my body knows what it's doing. If yes. I just treat it right, if I feed it the right foods and yes. Obviously, you know, my, my daughter, who's 13, had her last day of seventh grade yesterday. So she said, can we have a pool party, you know, and have my friends over? And so we had like 13 kids here. And so I put out grapes and strawberries, but we also put out, you know, potato chips and we had cookies. And oh, my gosh, every time I walked by, I was like, you know, grabbing a little piece of cookie and touching it in my face. Or sure. like, I was like, ooh, cheese pops. <laughs> so, you know, I was eating the cheese pops and... Yeah, so now I'm going to have to like really hike this afternoon. <laughs> well, you know, I, I have a weakness for those things as well. And I want to, I want to make you feel better about one thing. And I, I've written about this as well. Um, it, the statement is this. How you eat is more important than what you eat. 
this is very countercultural. It's kind of the same kind of a countercultural thing as when I tell someone stress isn't your problem. It's the inability to handle that stress. Right. Or when I tell someone cholesterol is not the problem, it's the need for that cholesterol that's the problem. Let's eliminate the need and your liver will relax and stop producing that cholesterol. So then how you eat is much more important than what you eat. Really? Yeah. So if you are eating broccoli and let's say um, uh, a, a filet of wild caught salmon, you know, with, with, you know, maybe some Brussels sprouts or kale, you know, and, and it, it's made beautifully with the right fats and the right spices and, and no additives. I mean, you just imagine you, what you would consider to be the healthiest food, but you eat it the wrong way. I'm here to tell you that food will become poison in your body. I can guarantee it. Now you eat something that's not so healthy, like the cookie and the cheese puffs, but you eat it in the right state and it's not going to be that unhealthy for you. I have some proof on this. So, and the proof is this. Uh, have you heard of the French paradox? I have not. Okay. So the French are immune to heart disease. There's no heart disease. There's hardly any heart disease in France. And the heart disease you will find is either an, an American immigrant or an American tourist. That's right. there. For the most part, the Fr in France, there's no heart disease. And when I was and there... They, I, they eat like, what, croissants and, you know, the, like the buttery and drink a lot of red wine. and yeah. Exactly. That's the paradox. Their diet is wine, cheese, and bread. Right. <laughs> wine, cheese, and bread. And, and, and the breads are... You know, of course, right, some, carbs. Right? I love them. I mean, my, I wish I could do that. I wish I could. Live. And when I, I was in Paris for three weeks and, uh, you, you know, I got to hang out with the locals and, and see what they eat. And really, that's how they eat. But I noticed there were no um, there's nobody overweight there. Um, and those who were overweight were the tourists from other countries, not not French. So how does that work? Here's what happens when we were hanging out with the French. With, you know, my friend was living there at the time. He had been living there for several years and then all his friends were French. And so when it came to be lunchtime, we would sit down and we would eat a long meal, not large, but a long meal. It took us two hours to eat lunch. And this is in the middle of their work day. And then they would go back to work two hours later or they wouldn't go back to work. And if we were to eat dinner, that took minimum two hours, more likely three and a half hours to eat dinner. Yeah, you know what it reminds me of the movie Eat, Pray, Love. When I don't know if you saw it, but when you know uh, Julia Roberts' character goes to Italy and she so she goes and visits these different countries, but how f the food became more about like the communal aspect of it and um, enjoying being with these friends, these newfound friends and um, the community of it and, yeah. and, and just savoring right. flavors exactly. and the deliciousness of it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's it. Do you, do you know most people right now, as we're speaking, you know, if, if it's lunchtime when you're listening to this, um, they're probably eating in their car. Right. They went through some kind of drive through and and or or they packed their lunch right let's say they packed a really healthy lunch but because of the high stress nature of society sometime uh they're they're eating while they're driving and, and they're yelling at the other driver right. and they're probably also on the phone with with a business colleague talking about business their body is in fight or flight their body is it because you know the nervous system you can divide it into fight or flight and rest and repair Right. Yeah. Some say rest and digest, you know, some say wine and dine. I like rest and repair because repair happens in this state. There's no repair happening in this state. So if you have a wound and you're in fight or flight all the time, it heals very, very slow. That's research proven. But if you're in rest and repair, it heals much more fast, quickly, easily, safely. Uh, so, so how do we get into that state? That's, by the way, the reason that person I said you're wired and tired, you try to fall asleep, you can't fall asleep, is because your body's in fight or flight. 
fight yeah. or flight is when your heart rate's a little higher, there's, some, there's a little bit of adrenaline in your body, your cholesterol levels are higher, and, and believe it or not, your neocortex shuts down, and your primitive brain works. That's where you can't really think that clearly either. Your memory starts to fail a little bit, and that's why, that's why people who stay in that are more susceptible to things like dementia. They're also more susceptible to diabetes, which is why really soon, and, and your audience will see this you know, within the next five to 10 years, there's a new type of diabetes, which now is called dementia, but it's going to be called type three diabetes. Type three diabetes is dementia, is brain not working properly because of your blood sugar, sugar imbalances. Now, um, you, you want to fall asleep, you need to bring your body back to rest and repair. Right. And during fight or flight, let's say I'm, I'm nervous, I'm worried, I'm scared, but I have to eat something. Your digestive system is not really working at that point. Your right. blood leaves your digestive system. It shuts down. It goes to your muscles and your brain. The neocortex shuts down. The brain goes to the primitive part of the brain that thinks about fighting or running away. So you put food in your body. Your body. So uh, it's like if if you're ever really nervous before a race. Athletes will explain. What we'll talk about this is they throw up before a big race because the body wants to empty out what's in there because that's not the time for digestion. So if you're putting food in your body, your body is in a state of fight or flight. Your food, unfortunately, is not going to get digested properly. People in chronic stress have these things. Dry eyes, dry mouth, dry skin. Chronic sinus infections or frequent head colds. They're the ones that catch a cold in the summer. Right. And they have chronic constipation because their immune system goes down. Blood leaves your skin, so you have dry eyes, dry mouth, dry skin. It goes to the muscles all the time. And digestive tract is very, very slow, and it's not working properly. So they have chronic constipation. So those are the people who take antibiotics on a regular basis because of sinus infection. They, they take uh, stool softeners on a regular basis, and they always have to have moisturizers on, and their mouth is always dry. Well, all we'd have to do is switch them from fight or flight to rest and repair. That was now, the part I was just going to ask you. Like The hope part of it is – that you can take control of it and that you can change and, and help your body to get back centered help. Yes. I mean, but, but it's, it's through, you know, your mind and through, yes. um, yeah, like, like I call it changing habitual patterns Yes, and changing yes. the habit of how you think, how you respond. You know, I think of me when I was, you know, experiencing severe panic attacks and how I started to change my habitual patterns and my responses and my avoidance behaviors and how that shifted everything, um, you know, as far as my, my response, what you're just talking about, that flight or fight response, well, exactly. flight, fright, freeze, freeze was mine <laughs> in a lot of, re in a lot of ways. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, and I, lo I love the idea that um, if if people, you know, audience members are listening to this and thinking, oh my God, <laughs> like, you know, I am that person that can't fall asleep or, you know, is, you know, exhausted, that there is hope that, that they yeah. can make these changes. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, so let me tell you that really quick and it's yeah. simple. Easy. You can do it immediately and you can do it every day. Uh, number one, though, um, every time you're about to eat food, you stop. Even if you only have 10 minutes to eat, you need to stop. You need to relax. You need to, it needs to be an experience that you look forward to and enjoy. And in fact, it's good if you play some classical music. Baroque classical music actually changes your mind, your state. So play some music, say a gratitude prayer before you put food in your mouth and get in that state. Don't drive and eat. Don't argue with someone while you're eating. Don't be on the phone while you're eating. Don't work while you're eating. If you have to get back to work, Eat less and eat a smaller meal so you can finish sooner, but don't rush. Eating fast puts you in fight or flight. So that's, that's the best thing you can do. How you eat makes your food more healthy. Just relax and eat slow. Now, from a shifting completely, let me ask you this. If something terrible were to happen, let's say right now where you're sitting, the wall started shaking, the ceiling started falling down, you heard all these loud noises, are you going to breathe a sigh of relief or are you going to gasp? Gasp, right, right. Exactly. Inhale. And then if something, if you found out that it's just a joke and it's just Amir playing a joke on Terry, then you're going to breathe a sigh of relief, right? You're going to exhale. 
We inhale when we're in fight or flight. We exhale when we're in rest and repair. For our body to stay in rest and repair, exhale needs to be twice as long as inhale. How easy would that be? All you do is count when you're breathing in, right? So you breathe in for a count of seven. Pick a number, five. Five might be easier. Right. Breathe in for a count of five, and then exhale for a count of ten, twice as long as inhale. And I guarantee you, if you do this, now you, you have to breathe very, very deep. Okay, so and it can't be seconds because inhaling for a full five seconds might be difficult. Just count as fast as you want, just a rhythm, like a metronome. Right. And the minute you hit five, you start exhaling. Use your lips to control how much air leaves your body so that you don't lose all the air before the count of 10 and just start exhaling. 10 of those breaths will stop your mind from running and it'll let you fall asleep. And the reason your mind's running and it's not letting you fall asleep is because imagine you're being um, chased by a pack of hungry wolves. Are you going to be able to take a nap and fall asleep? You're going to stay alert, right? Your body thinks it's being chased. Right. You tell it there's nothing wrong right now. You can relax. So physiologically shifting into that rest and repair state, you'll fall asleep. It's like when you eat a big, uh, big meal with a, a little bit of wine and you feel really relaxed and you sit on the couch, you put your feet up on the coffee table and it doesn't matter what's on TV. You're just relaxed. That's the state you need to be in a fall asleep. And you can do that by your breathing. Right. Very you know, I find it when you're talking, it's just very fascinating to me because I do a lot of breathing exercises as part of, I do a lot of mindfulness. And so I, I do mindfulness practice in nature, but I, I also will sit if, you know, if I feel myself, you know, stressed out about something, I'll just take a moment and I'll go sit and just do 10 minutes of mindfulness. And I was doing, I don't know if I heard a meditation or if somebody recommended, you know, you know, do seven seconds of, you know, deep in breath and seven seconds out and seven seconds in seven seconds out, kind of like a rolling breath or, or like I've heard four square, like breathe in four, hold for four, out four, hold for yeah. four, that. But what I've always found, or at least as I've practiced mindfulness, and I kind of was like, I'm just fascinated by this. I tend to breathe in, you know, I'll take five to seven seconds in, but then I take so much longer to exhale. Good. So I was fascinated by it because I'm like, I wonder why I breathe out longer. And so again, it must just be my body saying, you know what, let's just take a little more time to, and, and I go with it because I just, you know, I'll notice what my body needs, but yeah. I just, you just answered a question for me. So thank there you. you that's, that's very fascinating. Yeah. When we're in fight or flight, it's a one to one ratio. When we're in rest and repair, it's a one to two ratio. And, and that's perfect. That's what you want. So that uh, must be my mindfulness working is that absolutely. I'm just, yeah. Absolutely. It's that all the other ones are valid, you know, the box breathing and everything that's valid. It, it increases your oxygen saturation, which is fantastic. Right. It, it does help you calm your mind and your body and all of that is fantastic. But to be in true rest and repair outside of fight or flight, it does require exhale to be longer. Yeah, I love it. Thank you. Yeah, so really you know, I talk about the simple seven, seven simple things you can do every day to move into that rest and repair and to increase your ability to handle stress and they're all spelled out in my book but it's it's how you sleep it's how you eat not not how long you sleep again it's how well you sleep very right. different and we talk about music we talk about visualization we talk about the breathing all these great things you know types of physical exercise all of that will increase your ability to handle stress so that you don't have to leave your family and your job, that you can actually be a better family member and a better provider and handle all that stress and see beautiful results from it. Not breakdown, but improvement in health. Right, right. That's beautiful. I'm going to switch us way off course here only because I have to ask you one of my favorite questions because I ask it of every guest. Awesome. And I love the answers that I get. So, if you could meet anyone, dead or alive, to help you with your continued journey, who would it be? <laughs> the very first name that came to my mind is actually Jesus. I would want to walk with Jesus. I would want to be side by side with him. I want to see him do all those miracles that he did where, you know, he turned water into wine and, and healed all those, you know, uh, uh, being a chiropractor, I work with my hands. Yeah. I, mean, I, yeah. I, 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 I 
you know, and, and now our practice is very different. I have other doctors that are working in the practice. So my interaction has been less with patients, but I make sure I at least have two full days where I'm, I have my hands on patients and really experiencing that. And, and to be Jesus where I could just touch and instantly heal someone, not just instantly heal them, but permanently heal them, and to heal them from debilitating, crippling diseases in a moment, I really want that. I want to see that, and I wish I could, I could do that. And that's, that's my biggest thing. That's really a cool answer, and I love it. And, and in so many ways, you know, I think about my chiropractor, and I was telling you before we recorded, you know, that yes. um, just visiting him over these past two weeks is just – help me again feel more centered and um but he does that and you know his the way he was he's so understanding and compassionate about you know my feeling dizzy and off center and so he would he he adjusted how he normally does um you know adjustments on on patients and he and it was just really sweet he'd be like let's start you on your side you know and then he would hold my ha head so gently as you know he'd move me to my back and he would be like let's not put you all the way back let me hold you right here wow. and so again i love that i love that comparison of because i feel like he has healed me with his yeah. touch and his um gentleness of in his compassion and exactly. i think jesus was very much along those same lines in his sure. you know his message and so yeah that's beautiful absolutely uh, well i'm glad you're in good hands i i yeah. i like your chiropractor already yeah <laughs> he's a good guy yeah he's a good guy very cool <laughs> so is there anything else you'd like to share with with the audience that we haven't touched on yet uh before we end you know um the main thing is that it's about living your life. It's, it's about how well you live. Are you, are you living a life that you're enjoying, that's useful, uh, that, that, that benefits others be, and, and, and provides for you? And, and how do we live that life? And, and the minute we step outside of ourselves and start looking around us at what's there and what some of the other needs are, and we start to realize there are a lot of needs of a lot of other people that we could meet. We have so much, so many times people will say, when I have more, I'm going to give more, or when I can do this, or when I have more time, believe it or not, it's so counterintuitive. Everything we talked about today is a little counterintuitive, right? Don't reduce stress. Actually increase it if you want to get stronger. You know, how you eat is better than what you eat. And, and you know, um, you know all, all these things, countercultural. This is another one is, is start to give away the things you think you don't have enough of, and then you'll find abundance. Yeah. Give a little more of your time. Give a little of your money, a little more of your resources, your time, talents, and treasure. Start giving to people who need it. All of a sudden, you'll start to experience abundance in ways you would never experience. Oh, I love it. I'm such a big fan of what you put out into the universe is what comes back to you. Absolutely. And very, very much so. You know, I told you beforehand, we have the therapy dog, Sammy, that's at yeah. my feet right now. And she... You know, just we just go on Tuesday mornings and we volunteer with kids in a local school. And just I get so much joy out yes. of watching her give so much joy. Yes. Um, and it's just, oh, my gosh, it's healing to it me. Is. And I feel selfish for it because it. I think I get so much more out of it. I mean, obviously, these kids get tremendous joy out of it. But I absorb all of that. Yeah. Um, and I think you're right in that. You know, if you can learn to give out these yes. gifts and these, yeah, this, this beautiful energy that we all have, yes. the light, as I call it, you know, we all shine this light. Um, yeah, it's amazing the light that comes back and the energy that comes back. Exactly. Yeah. Beautiful. I love yeah. it. Thank you. Thank you so all much. Right. Well, it's been just a, a joy to have you here with me. And, um, you know, I could sit and listen to you. We could, like, talk for the next, you know, six hours. And right. I, could, I could learn so much from you. And oh, and Likewise, I could learn from you. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you for joining me today. And so how do people get a hold of you? How do they find the book? Um, yeah, you know. Well, there's, there's a new book coming out. It's going to be called Taming Your Stress Monkey. Um, I can't tell you when that's coming out, but if you just search for my name on Amazon, there's another one called the stress proof life that has a lot of things we talked about today. Yes. 
life. And then um, uh, I, the website is midatlanticclinic.com. And then um, on YouTube, like you had said, there's there's videos about me that, that it's MACC Health is the YouTube channel. Um, so I'd be honored if you'd watch those and um, hopefully we'll interact sometime. Absolutely. Yes. Well, again, thank you for joining me. I'm going to do a quick little close out here sure. and then we'll chat for just a second. You're Everyone, welcome. thank you for joining us today on the Healing Place podcast. And until next time, remember, be gentle with yourselves. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank mm -hmm. you.